Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. On this lecture, we will be starting Module C. I also, I have to remind people that for the quiz answers, you have to show that you've watched the lecture, but it doesn't do me much good to tell you in a lecture that you have to watch the lecture. So if you have friends in the class, tell them, I really do care. Americans during the so-called progressive era thought of themselves as making progress on all sorts of things. And the progressive era is, you could either think of it as the 1880s to about 1920, or you can think of it dividing that time period into the Gilded Age, which is the first half up to 1900, and the progressive era, which is after. For this, I'm going to use the word Gilded Age, sometimes the phrase Gilded Age, sometimes, but I will be considering the entire period from the 1880s through the 1910s, or really up to World War I, because everything changes then, as being the progressive era. Americans during the progressive era thought of themselves as making progress on all sorts of things. Certainly, there were technological and medical developments, but the idea of progress suggests progressing or moving toward something, meaning that there's an end point or a goal. The problem with this is that in a country with millions of people, that goal is not going to be the same for everyone. So whose vision of progress counts? And perhaps more to the point, whose does not? Today, we are zooming in on industry and taking a closer look at how industrial workers live and what the owners did with the profits. Industrialization came up previously with innovations in industrial capitalism, being vertical and horizontal integration and railroads. Industry really ramped up in the period of Module C, American industry, but also industry around the world. And industrial production in the U.S. skyrocketed. But the boom-bust linkages with Europe would not disappear, although the booms would benefit the wealthy most and the busts would cost them the least. This chart basically shows industrial growth from 1800 until 1910. You can see that it's slowly increasing, picking up a little bit in the antebellum or pre-American Civil War era. Industrialization starts to increase more in the time period of Module B from the end of the Civil War to somewhere in the 1880s, and then it shoots up in the time period of Module C. Industry supplied and relied on other industry. So the growth became more and more rapid as it went on. The steam engine was actually a product of the first industrial revolution of the late 1700s to early 1800s. But by our period, steam engines powered railroads also early factories, which meant that there had to be factories to build the parts for other factories to build their engines and tools to fix them and so on. The internal combustion engine needed gas to run on. Think of gas reserves as well as coal reserves when you're thinking about the land use and expansion throughout the entire middle of the continent for the U.S. In addition to needing gas to run, the internal combustion engine also needed all the parts to make it to begin with, and it revolutionized transportation, which required more parts to be made. The vulcanization of rubber, it's a process that you submit rubber to to make it last longer. It made raincoats more effective, as you see in the ad on the screen. It also made tires, again, part of making the automobile a possibility, which spurned many industries, not just factories making cars. I said spurned. I meant spurred. They're very different words. One more world-changing invention path before we head into the main lecture. Often when I see essays on the invention of the sewing machine, they focus almost entirely on the home sewing machine, but that was not the only kind. Industrial sewing machines 
revolutionized, and yes, that word shows up a lot, the production of clothing, but also upholstery and home furnishings. The sewing machines themselves required factories to create and supply parts, including grease for gears. And sewing machines increased the demand for textiles that also made more factories to produce textiles. What you may have noticed in the three examples of snowballing industrialization that I've given here is that there are people in all of the factory images. Lots of people. Machines increased both speed of production and output, but they still required human labor and lots of it. That human labor had to live and sleep and eat and do regular human things. I chose the images on the slide because if you focus on the vanishing point in each one way back here and on this one, it's more on the left. In each, you get an idea of the absolute size of factories and the number of people it took to work in them, row after row after row of workers. These massive numbers of workers had to live somewhere, preferably close enough to the factory that they could use newly designed public transit to get to work. This meant an exponential growth in cities or urbanization. Big cities like New York got bigger, and industrial cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh housed tons and tons of workers. Here again, industry begot industry, but not all at once. And that meant that cities grew, but not always efficiently or logically. If you look closely in about the lower middle here, you can see the horse's feet under the carriage there. The trouble with horses, which were still used for most of these things, horses in a city continue to poop and pee. So whose responsibility is it, if anyone's, to clean that up? For that matter, people produce waste as well. Same question, who cleans it up? How is it done and who pays those workers? Where does the rubbish go? We've seen the issue with slaughterhouses and the water supply in New Orleans. Same problem came up in Chicago with its vast facilities for slaughtering cattle from Western ranches before shipping the meat east. But even just daily life produces rubbish and some of it, much of it, rather nasty. Running water and sewage disposal were problems that were only solved after cities had grown massively in both the U.S. and Europe. We've discussed that cities like New York, Chicago, New Orleans, and Detroit first developed where there were ports for shipping. Ports mean water, and water seems like a great way to dispose of waste, right? Unless you are drinking that same water which was the case in almost all of these urban areas. Waste in water means disease, and germ theory, with its implications for managing contagion, arrived in the 1860s, with meant, which meant that developments in understanding how to deal with sewage could only come later. Chicago dealt with the ravages of typhoid, cholera, dysentery, and other waterborne diseases by actually reversing the flow of the river through the city. But this was a monumental feat of engineering that could not happen in other cities. The image that you see there was taken during that river reversal project, and the image is from 1900. Think about all the tools and all the machines that needed to be produced in factories for this project and the size of the labor force that was required. Just for the record, these folks in the picture here are not the labor force. They are all bigwigs, which you can tell by the hats and coats, who have come out to look at the progress of the work that's happening. I briefly mentioned in an earlier lecture the fact that the Bessemer process of making steel meant that steel replaced wood as the framework for buildings, with the result that buildings could reach ever greater heights and house more and more factories and workers. Cities that went up kept workers closer to their jobs, but closer is a relative measure. 
people needed to have transport to work. Electricity and engines made trolleys and cable cars possible, as you see in the left here. And huge advances in engineering meant that cities could build down as well as up. The image on the right is the first New York subway. It looks a little tiny compared to now. And it was taken in 1904. Just as with the Chicago picture, the image is bigwigs at the opening of the subway and not ordinary folks. Jacob Rees immigrated from Denmark via Scotland in 1870. Between that year and 1900, somewhere in excess of 12 million people immigrated to the U.S., mostly settling in cities. Meanwhile, people born in the United States migrated from the countryside to cities as technology made it easier to increase farm production with less labor. Reese would go on to be a pioneer in muckraking photojournalism with his book, How the Other Half Lives, that you're looking at here. It was, as most muckraking journalism was, intended to expose the realities of poverty to the wealthy, but even more to the middle class, a topic that will come up in this module in a later lecture. You can still order printings of How the Other Half Lives from Amazon. Reese arrived in New York and concentrated his efforts on New York's Lower East Side. So those are the pictures I'm going to be showing you for a moment or two. Following the Civil War, New York's wealthy residents left the Lower East Side for the Upper East Side, which remains a highly affluent district in Manhattan. Meanwhile, in the 1880s, over 300,000 people were crammed into the single square mile that constituted the Lower East Side. The image on the screen is from 1895. No plumbing, no real ventilation, no electricity, which meant that heating and cooking required open flame in this wooden slum. You can see what we more typically think of as tenements going up in the background here. By 1900, somewhere around 2.3 million people, about two-thirds of New York City's population, lived in the tenements that were growing upward. That meant more rooms per acre of building footprint, but not much change in plumbing, sanitation, waste disposal, or electricity. There are windows you see here for some ventilation and light, but nowhere near enough for the number of residents, and you are not seeing the interior apartments, which had no windows. Laundry had to be scrubbed by hand in a tub, a tub of water obtained from a tap somewhere in the neighborhood, and lugged home, which generally meant upstairs. This laundry here that's hung out was treated as a sign of slovenliness at the time by the upper classes, but it is really a testament to how hard these people, many of the women working in factories themselves, tried to keep their living spaces and their clothing clean. This is the entirety of the apartment that this family occupied. You can see a stove that burns probably wood, but possibly coal on the left. That's the kitchen. The bedrooms are the beds. No bathroom. Using the loo meant either going to one of the few outside toilets that served the entire building or using a chamber pot with the family around. There are seven people in this photo. But you can tell that their clothes and dishes are clean and as well kept as is humanly possible. The floor is virtually spotless. Not everyone had the health or stamina to maintain that level of care. The photo on the left was taken in 1905 and the one on the right in 1897. You can tell on the one on the right, the man shown here is not the only resident because there are multiple beds. You can see corners of them here and multiple buckets that people used for everything that required water. It was vanishingly rare that one person could afford an apartment of their own. 
single men might pay for a bed or really a part of a bed per night. You can see that there are at least two men in every bed in this photo. So one head, head in an arm. Here's this guy who's plainly visible, but here's the arm and feet of the guy with him. This young man, there's a person here, and it looks like there might be a person under the covers here. If you did not have enough money for a room or a bed, if you were lucky, you could hunt up some floor space at the homeless shelter and provide your own bedding. But if that were filled, you had to get creative, like this fellow in the basement of either a tenement or a factory. I'm not sure which it is. We have talked about separate spheres in live lecture. That's the ideal created for the middle class at this time period that separated the domestic or living sphere entirely from the world of work, with the home, the domain of women, and the work world, that of men. When this is your domestic space, such an ideal is both meaningless and ridiculous. In the image on the right, taken in 1887, it looks like the woman is sitting in a storeroom, but in fact, this is her home. You can see the stove in the right foreground here and various tubs for drinking water, cooking, and cleaning distributed about, and the Bedding is piled up behind her during the day, so there's a, enough floor space to move around in to do things like care for the baby and cook. The fellow on the left here, and whomever he lived with, again, you can see multiple beds, so you know there was more than one person. They've actually built this home under the Rivington Street dump. You can see in this photo, and if you look closely at others, that people put up decoration to try to make these spaces into homes. Not all work could be finished by machines in factories, especially in the textile trades. People would do what was called piece work, meaning that they would collect the materials to be assembled from a factory take them home and do the required handwork, and then take the finished pieces back to the factory. This work was paid according to the number of finished pieces, which meant that piecework did not get recorded under shifts or hours worked. This was done often on top of factory shifts. Here in this image, both men and women, possibly from the same family, but I'm not sure, are making neckties. In this slide, a family works together in their home to make silk flowers that were used on hats and dresses. The only one not working is the baby back here who is being cared for by another child. Once again, this is why it bothers me so much when people now apply the idea of separate spheres to a past in which that ideal could not possibly be met. There is no separation of home and paid employment here. There are no separate spheres with women staying home to care for the family. The entire family had to take care of one another. This is not a world in which women did not work. Women worked in the home and out of it before middle-class women started to forge professional careers, which is usually what people mean when they say women started working. Reese made it easy to show what New York looked like, but New York was not an exception, and Reese was not the only muckraker or journalist who sought to expose the realities of industry work. For example, Upton Sinclair wrote an expose of the meat processing industry in Chicago and the treatment of immigrant labor there. I try to keep your workload not too overwhelming in this class, so I don't have you read full books. However, not requiring and not recommending are two different things. If you want to get a better grasp on industrial America at the turn of the 20th century, the jungle is short and easy to read rapidly. That was the bottom half who handled the production side of things. Now we'll get into the stories of the great men of industry and take a peek in their homes, many of which have since been turned into hotels or libraries 
or just open to tourists if they weren't demolished in the 1920s and 30s. William Rockefeller Jr. here founded Standard Oil, which you know from earlier lectures, and you will know even more when we talk about labor. He founded Standard Oil in 1870 together with his brother, John D. Rockefeller. And within a decade, the siblings were among the richest people in the entire world. In 1886, this Rockefeller, though William Jr., paid the equivalent of $4.4 million in today's money to acquire the Rockwood estate that you are looking at which overlooks the Hudson River near Sleepy Hollow, New York. And yes, that is the legend of Sleepy Hollow, Sleepy Hollow. The oil tycoon then extended the property to 1,000 acres and transformed the existing house into what was essentially a 204-room castle. The interiors of Rockwood Hall were the handiwork of a highly sought-after group of designers and artisans. Suitably grand, these rooms included a great hall, library, drawing room, billiard room, and other formal spaces, all of which were furnished in luxury materials such as marble, oak, and onyx. The house also featured 14 master suites that would be rooms with a dressing room and a bathroom, and 15 servants' bedrooms. So we're thinking about ten tenements that have no plumbing, and those people are working for. Following William Jr.'s death in 1922, the property passed to his nephew, John D. Rockefeller Jr., who sold it a year later. Rockwood Hall was reinvented as a posh country club, but the business floundered during the Great Depression and the building was demolished in the early 1940s. The richer of the Rockefellers, that would be John D., went on to become the world's first billionaire. A frequent visitor to his brother's estate, the wealthier sibling bought land in the nearby po Pocantico Hills in 1893 and commissioned his own palatial mansion, which, like Rockwood, overlooked the Hudson. Rivaling Rockwood in splendor, the 40-room dwelling was originally designed as a steep-roofed three-floor mansion, but the plans were radically changed by the celebrated art architect who was pulled in, who created a more ornate six-story Georgian revival edifice. Now, I'll tell you, the tenements were usually six or seven stories tall. John D. went all out on interiors, calling in a top designer who decorated the elegant neoclassical style rooms with English antique furniture from England that had to be shipped, collections of prized Chinese and European ceramics, including Ming Dynasty pieces bought from the collection of banker J.P. Morgan. John D. also equipped his estate with all the latest must-have amenities, like a private golf course and tricked-out coach barn filled with gleaming carriages and cars. Ultimately, the mansion served as the home to four generations of the Rockefeller family, with each resident adding to its prestige and its art collection. Coke, that would be the coal processing product, not the drink. Coke and steel baron Henry Clay Frick racked up a fortune second only to the Rockefellers and could afford to go all out on his Manhattan mansion that you're looking at. At its completion in 1913, the 61-room Fifth Avenue property was described as the most expensive and sumptuous house in America. The plot of land that it stood on alone cost $76 million in today's money. Frick appointed the same firm that did Rockwood Hall's interiors, and the brief for the house, meaning his instructions, were that it should be in good taste, but not ostentatious. Not sure ostentatious meant to him what it means to me. In case you are wondering why I am giving the robber barons so much space in lecture, I think that it's important to really grasp what they thought of 
as charity and philanthropy when we get to those, meaning that they were willing to donate money to charity and found libraries or museums. But this must be done by forcing the lower classes to accept the values of the upper classes. Now, not the desires of the upper classes, but the values that the upper classes placed on the lower classes. And most particularly, that the working class accept subservience and express gratitude. That, of course, was entirely alien to workers who wanted to be treated as adult human beings capable of understanding their own needs and with a right to their own desires. You have a reading in this module from the book that's illustrated on the slide, and I don't know why I left the picture on the far left with that big white space, but whatever. That reading, I think, will be more effective if you have a visual. And since I can't take you to these buildings in person, although I do recommend visiting the ones that are museums now, the next best thing is to make the inequities between worker and owner obvious through a series of still images. Brick packed the mansion with collections of Renaissance and Rococo furniture shipped from Europe, Meissen and Sèvres porcelain, Limoges enamels, and one of the finest privately held collections of paintings in the world, including works by Hobin, Vermeer, Goya, and Fragonard. The most impressive spaces may be the cavernous East and West libraries, because one wasn't enough, which have concave glass ceilings. Brick lived in the property for just five years. At his death in 1919, the tycoon requested that mansion and contents, including the unbelievable art collection, become a museum. And he left $15 million, the equivalent of $241 million today, to fund the eponymous, meaning named after him, Art Museum, which opened in 1935. The coda for this lecture shows a few pieces of clothing from the era, this Gilded Age era, presented as art and exhibited recently in the Frick Museum. Aside from the Rockefellers, the other great dynasty of the so-called Gilded Age was that of the Vanderbilt clan, who built more than their fair share of over-the-top mansions, with the money they raked in from shipping and railroads. Cornelius Vanderbilt II, for instance, ended up erecting New York City's largest and arguably grandest home. Constructed on the Millionaire's Row section of Fifth Avenue, the chateauesque mansion required 600 artisans to toil away day and night. The house, if you can call it that, featured 130 rooms, including a regal 65 by 50 foot ballroom, a Louis XIV style salon, and a Moorish-influenced smoking room. The dining room was adorned with paintings by the likes of Constable Rousseau and Millet. And if you don't know all of these artists, I'll just say that those paintings are worth more than my life right now. John D. Rockefeller was usurped as the richest person in the world during the 1900s by his arch rival and our old friend, Andrew Carnegie. The Scottish American industrialist spearheaded the expansion of the steel industry in the US, stockpiling a fortune that translates into hundreds of billions in today's money. A renowned philanthropist, Carney gave away what could be considering considered a staggering 90% of his wealth during his lifetime, funding everything from charities to universities, but still also funding this house and not raising wages for his workers. In 1898, he bought 1.3 acres of land along Fifth Avenue, a mile north of the most desirable stretch, so, you know, he was slumming it, and asked his architects to design the, quote, most modest 
plainest and most roomy house in New York. Yeah, that, that place on the screen, that's modesty to me. The mansion also had state-of-the-art technology. It was the first residence in America to be built around a steel frame, like the tenements were, and one of the first to have an Otis lift, or elevator, and central heating. Another wow factor was the property's private garden, which is the largest in New York. In fact, part of Carnegie's reasoning to buy away from the big fashionable area on Fifth Avenue was to ensure that there would be enough space for backyard. After Carnegie's death in 1919, his wife stayed in the house until her death in 1946, when it was bequeathed to the Carnegie Foundation. That would be the philanthropic foundation that Carnegie set up for after his death. In 1972, the foundation gifted it to the Smithsonian, and the building is now occupied by the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, which actually is a really great museum, and they have a, a good website for looking at design. Meat Packing Air, J. Ogden Armour, topped Chicago's Rich List. This is the Chicago of the Jungle, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. He was one of the wealthiest people in America during the early part of the 20th century. Melody Farms, the home of his family, and you're looking at it here, in Lake Forest, Illinois, was completed in 1908 at a cost of $305 million in today's money. The mansion was kitted out with French antiques from the 18th century, fancy columns, cornices, and paneling, gold, not gold in, but gold doorknobs, 20 marble fireplaces, a carved walnut Georgian broom transplanted from a London townhouse, the whole room, plus a bowling alley. Other pricey features included an orangery, stables, ponds stocked with fish, and private power plant. Things actually did not end so well for J. Ogden Armour. The meatpacking magnet went broke during the economic slump that followed the First World War, losing a million dollars a day over 130 days. He did, however, manage to hold on to Melody Farms up until his death in 1927, but it was offloaded not long after and it became part of the elite Lake Forest Academy Prep School in 1947. Nicknamed the King of New York, German-born financier Otto Hermann Kahn was one of the richest people during the Gilded Age and early 20th century. After his first country manor in Morriston, New Jersey, was gutted by fire in 1905, the baker went on to Huntington, Long Island. Kahn pulled out all the stops, hiring top-notch firm to design a European-style castle, which you are looking at there with its grounds. He went on to spend the equivalent of $158 million. So that's just what's going on the house, not on his day-to-day -day upkeep, not on his transportation, not on entertaining, just into the house. 127 rooms, which at 109,000 square feet became America's second biggest private home upon its completion in 1919, bypassing Rockwood Hall. Determined his new fantasy property would not succumb to a blaze like his first one, Khan had it built in concrete and steel. Outside, the grounds included tennis courts, one of the country's largest complexes of greenhouses, stables, orchards, an 18-hole golf course, and, you know, even an airline landing strip. That's not hyperbole. That's not exaggeration. That's description. Khan died in 1934, and after changing hands several times in 1980, 84, this property was restored and converted into a luxury hotel. Edward T. Stotesbury was among the most important investment bankers of the Gilded Age. Now, I want you to think about investment bankers in that boom-bust cycle. Okay. 
he was one of the richest people through the Gilded Age and the early 20th century in Philadelphia with a fortune equivalent to $3 billion today. Construction began on White Marsh Hall that you're looking at there in 1916. Once again, a famous architect was hired to design a stately 147-room manse, which at 100,000 square feet would eclipse the White House. That would be the president's house in size and become America's eh, only third biggest private home. Dubbed the American Versailles after the French Palace, the residence was completed in 1921 at an estimated cost of $10 million at the time, or $155 million in today's money. The banker hosted lavish parties there for those in his socioeconomic class. After visiting White Marsh Hall, Henry Ford, yes, of automobiles, declared that it was a great experience, this is a quote, to see how the rich live. We will be looking at Ford's residence quite soon. White Marsh Hall served as a museum storehouse and a laboratory, but became derelict in the 1960s and 70s because no one could keep it up, and it was demolished in 1980. The most jaw-dropping Gilded Age mansion. This is a single-family dwelling, folks. Uh, oh, except for the servants, but, you know, they don't count. This was built for George Washington Vanderbilt II, the brother of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. Beginning in 1889, over a thousand workers were hired to construct the colossal 108. 178,926 square foot residence on 700 parcels of land totaling 125,000 acres in scenic Asheville, North Carolina. Remembering that this sort of extraordinary privilege this is in the Jim Crow South, was justified because the titans of industry were self-made men, George W. Vanderbilt II inherited $2 million from his grandfather, received another million, that would be a million at the time, so much more now, on his 21st birthday as a present from his father, and upon his father's death, he inherited $5 million more as well as the income from a $5 million trust fund. The 250-room mansion was designed by Richard Morris Hunt, who happened to be the architect who designed the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Completed in 1895, the final bill for the unprecedented residence in North America came to $1.6 billion in today's money. During its heyday, the property hosted the great and good of American society from U.S. presidents. So as we go through the presidents in this module, you can imagine them visiting here to writers such as Edith Wharton and Henry James. Following George W.'s untimely death in 1914, his wife struggled with the running of the vast estate, which had become a major drain on her finances. Stung by taxes and the cost of maintaining Biltmore, as the estate was called, Edith disposed of large swaths of the estate land and opened the house to the public in 1930. Today, Biltmore is one of North Carolina's most popular tourist attractions. And finally, now we come back to Henry Ford, one of the richest self-made tycoons of all time and the one who commented on pleasure and interest in seeing how the rich live. Henry Ford commissioned Fairlane, his 1,300-acre estate in Dearborn, Michigan, not far from where the auto pioneer grew up. The property encompassed a farm, a laboratory, an indoor pool, a skating house, a bowling alley, a power plant, and numerous staff cottages, making it more like a village. Inside, great care was taken, in particular with the woodwork, 
The 29 foot banister that you see on the left there was meticulously carved from a single walnut tree. After the deaths of Ford and his wife, the house was stripped of many of its furnishings and used by the Ford Motor Company as a retreat. In 1957, it was donated to the University of Michigan, and Fair Lane now operates as a museum. Now, back to the real world for most of us. Ford is famous for making cars, but also for bringing assembly line construction to factories. And we will come back to that specific point in a moment. Factory owners wanted to maximize profits by paying workers as little as possible while getting as much work out of them as possible. In the 1880s, Taylor, whose book is on the right there, observed work workers looking for inefficient movements that could cost the company time and money. Notice worker help was not of concern there at all. He came up, he, Taylor, came up with scientific management, which is also sometimes called Taylorism. In this, he broke down worker movements into discrete timed tasks, stringing them together into routines that increased production. Scratching your nose would slow you down. This system, scientific management, still exists. It worked well for employers, resulting in greater productivity. While wages stayed low, profits went up, funding big houses. Workers, as I suspect you have already realized, were not nearly so pleased. Workers were expected to work faster and faster. The word speed up there on the slide is fairly self-explanatory. Workers could be fined for going too slowly. Workers also did not develop skills in these jobs that they could take elsewhere. There was no handicraft involved, just acting as a fleshy machine part. This again, the word on the lower right, it's quite logically called de-skilling. Finally, owners considered safety precautions to be a waste of money. A worker's finger could not be replaced for the worker, but the worker could be replaced for the factory. I said that we would come back to Ford and his contribution to both speed up and de-skilling. Ford is largely credited for bringing assembly line production to peak levels. Now, he didn't invent it. That sort of idea had been around, but he applied it to an industrial capitalist setting. Ford also was one employer who actually tried experiments with not treating his labor completely miserably. We will look at that more when we look at labor, next lecture, and again with the growth of the middle class after that. We have seen the boom-bust cycle that linked the United States and Europe in an earlier lecture. This included the 1873 depression brought on by the collapse of railroad expansion, failure of banks, and a 20-day closure of the New York Stock Exchange. I alluded to that one when I said in an earlier lecture that more than 100 smaller railway lines had failed or gone into bankruptcy by 1874, making it possible for big railroad companies to get even bigger on the cheap. That was 1873. 20 years later, in the panic of 1893, things got worse. France saw an economic downturn in 1889. So this is a snowballing or building effect which was not unique to the U.S., but shows the interconnection between Europe and the U.S., which is important when it comes to understanding World War I. Great Britain and Germany followed France into economic downturn and the collapse of speculative projects in European colonial outposts in what we now call the Global South caused banks in both Europe and the U.S. that had financed that speculation, meaning they funded things hoping to make money back, it caused those banks to falter. Many railroads had been financed by British banks that were in trouble. 
and money in railroad speculation led to the panic of 1893, meaning everyone who was worried tried to go at once and pull their money out of the bank, which only made the banks fail more. The poster on this slide is from a play about the Panic of 1893 that came out a couple of years after. The outcome on the ground in the U.S. of the Panic of 1893 was that by the peak of the ensuing depression, 15,000 companies, not people, 15,000 companies and 500 banks with people's savings in it failed erasing the money that had been entrusted to them. Failure and bankruptcy meant loss of jobs, and jobs in cities were hit the hardest. New York City saw an unemployment reach 35%. Economic volatility made life precarious at all levels, except the very tip top that we looked at a bit ago. Business people, small farmers, laborers, and their families could get slammed in a moment, and there was no help or support except that organized by the middle and lower classes themselves. The group in the slide are one group of unemployed in Chicago who have gathered together to look for work or food or help of any kind. In the next lecture, we will look at the direction taken by labor in response to all of this and go on to the middle class in the lecture after that. Key points to lecture nine. Industrial growth snowballed in the late 19th century as new industries required more new industries for parts and materials. Cities grew around and with factories, housing hundreds of thousands of workers in a confined space without sanitation, plumbing, or electricity, meaning that cooking, heating, and light depended on flame. Diseases like cholera, typhoid, and dysentery spread rapidly and took a large toll on life, especially among the urban poor. The self-made men who became titans of industry and banking spent absolute fortunes on palatial homes, but quibbled with workers about even small increases in wages. Labor in factories came from both immigration from Europe, and migration from rural areas in the U.S. Bosses wanted to get more out of workers without raising wages and came up with scientific management techniques to make every movement of a worker efficient and its assembly lines to keep work moving. These strategies increased productivity and profits for owners, but left workers exhausted from speed up and unable to take their labor to a higher paying factory because of de-skilling. Boom bust cycles made life precarious for the lower and middle classes while leaving the ultra wealthy largely unaffected. The panic of 1893 forced millions of people out of work in both Europe and America. In the U.S., there were no social programs to ease the struggles of poverty. This is a few of the examples of clothing from the Gilded Age that is from the collection of the Frick Museum, and we talked about Frick earlier in the lecture. These dresses here date to the early 1880s and were probably worn by Adelaide Frick in the social occasions that followed her engagement and marriage to Henry Clay Frick. This hat dates to the 1890s and is made of file. File has that kind of corded look. It's a weave of silk. And Georgette, which is a sheer crap, and that's the roughly bits down here. And it features an elegant stripe on the cream silk at the back, which you can see at the right here. The hat's most notable decoration, however, is the most of a dead bird. Bird feathers have a long history of use in clothing, headwear, and jewelry, and in the Gilded Age, feathers, wings, and even entire stuffed birds were popularly used to trim women's hats. 
the mass slaughter of birds for the millinery trade was a key factor in the creation of the Audubon Society in 1895. That's part of this progressive era forming societies. According to notes from Helen Clay Frick, Henry's daughter, her mother Adelaide Frick wore this ensemble from French designer Gustave Beer to a reception given at the White House by President Theodore Roosevelt, whom we'll get to in lectures. Dating to 1905, the S-curve or monobosom silhouette that you're looking at with the chest slightly forward and stuff draping off of it was the height of fashion at the time. This gown is one of eight evening dresses by Liechtenstein Siech Modes that remain in the collection at Frick Pittsburgh. So those are the ones that remain. This one belonged probably to the daughter and the house was the design house was a favorite of both Adelaide, wife to Henry and Helen, their daughter. Adelaide wore one of their designs at Helen's debut, that would be the coming out ball, and receipts from the family archives show both women ordering dresses frequently between the years of 1899 and 1911. And I will leave you on that. I actually think as an object, and as something created by artisans, this is a very beautiful thing. The fabrics are beautiful. The artistry is beautiful. It's just kind of too bad that 